Coming up on this week's show, Charlie Cochet is here to talk about wrapping up Dex and Sloan's story in the Final Thirds book. Plus, we chat about North Pole City Tales and more. Welcome to the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for readers and writers of gay romance fiction. If you can read it, write it, watch it, or listen to it, these two guys are going to talk about it. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Adams and Will Knaus. Welcome, everybody, to episode 111 of Jeff and Will's Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from JeffAdamsWrites.com. And I'm Will from WillKanaus.com. This week's episode is brought to you in part by listeners just like you. We'll have more information on how you can help support this show in just a few moments. Welcome back, everyone. Another week, another episode. Welcome back to you, sir. And welcome to you. It was a busy week. Um, it was. We, I had a lot of reading, and uh, yeah, I, that's yeah. kind of all I did. What did you do? Um, <laughs> I believe uh, Katie on Instagram actually indicated you were on a frenzy. You were having a reading frenzy. Uh, a little bit. <laughs> uh, it was a busy week. Uh, had a computer meltdown in the middle of the week. Oh, that sucked. Which was horrible. Uh, I was upgrading the Mac to the new OS, and the power blipped in the middle of that, and it was not pretty. But Melissa from Apple Online Support was my hero. <laughs> got it, got me back up and running. That's and all good. appropriately. So That's yeah, that good. was good. Uh, we got interviewed for a podcast this week. We did on Friday. I was feeling a little under the weather, but I rallied towards the end of the day, and Jeff and I talked to someone we both uh, admire. Very uh, much so. And... Um, we'll have a little more information on that interview uh, in next week's show. Yeah. And uh, we'll post if it drops this week. Mm -hmm. We'll post on our social about that. But yeah, it was very cool. And then uh, I was all about edits and revisions on Winger 3 this week. Yes. Uh, I hate, I, I, I'm kind of in that I hate that book phase. Uh, I hear ya. <laughs> I hear ya. But it'll all pull itself out later. And uh, working on promo stuff for Hockey Player's Heart. Uh, we've kind of started on some of that early stuff. So that's good. Yep. And we should mention, Happy Thanksgiving week to everyone in the U.S. who will be celebrating later this week. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Happy Thanksgiving to you, too. Yes. Uh, you want to talk about our giveaway a little bit? Yes. As some of you may already know, we are doing the Happy Holiday Paperback Giveaway. And this giveaway includes three paperbacks from P.D. Singer's Mountain series. Uh, a quick note, this is only for our U.S. listeners. Uh, I'm sorry, everyone overseas, but we are not made of gold, and we can't <laughs> we can't afford to mail books overseas. It's bananas expensive. So, if you would like more information on the holiday paperback giveaway, just go to biggayfictionpodcast.com slash holiday to get your chance to win. This giveaway runs through Sunday, Sunday um, December 10th, Yes, and we'll have a little more information on this giveaway later in the show. Indeed we shall. Now, really quickly, uh, we want to say thank you. We are very thankful, of course, for everyone who has joined us on Patreon. Now, you can help support the Big Gay Fiction Podcast with a monthly pledge through Patreon. For as little as 25 cents an episode, your pledge helps pay the costs of producing and distributing this sh very show. Now, for fans who pledge at the silver and gold levels, you'll have the exclusive opportunity to ask questions of our upcoming guests. Now, all patrons also have the option to have a personalized thank you sent directly to them. Mm -hmm. Now, any month that we have pledges that cover our monthly production costs, we'll produce a bonus show, especially for our patrons. And luckily, we have been able to meet our costs every single month since we started this uh, this past January. Yeah. Uh, it's been a really wonderful year, and thank you once again to everyone who has joined us in this magical, wacky journey that is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. <laughs> now, you can get more details on how to join us on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash biggayfictionpodcast. Your favorite new YA hero has arrived with Tracker Hacker by Jeff Adams, the first book in the Codename Winger series. At 16, Theo Reese is the youngest agent for tactical operational support. His way with computers makes him invaluable. He designs new gadgets, helps agents, including his parents, in the field, and works to keep the TOS network safe. But when a hacker breaches the system TOS uses to track agents, 
Theo is put to the test like never before. Thrust from behind the safety of his desk, Theo must go into the field to put a stop to the hack. He's scared, but resolved because one of the missing agents is his father. And just to make it more interesting, he has to keep everything a secret from his boyfriend and teammates. Can Theo get the job done, save his dad, and make things good with his boyfriend? Find out in Tracker Hacker by Jeff Adams, available in ebook and paperback from Harmony Inc. Press, Amazon.com, and other online retailers. So, would you like to elaborate further on the frenzy you were on this week with, with the books? I certainly will. The first book I want to talk about this week is Cowboys Don't Ride Unicorns by Tara Lane. Now, this is technically the sequel to Cowboys Don't Come Out. Um, as always, the usual disclaimer applies. You can certainly read this book all on its own. Um, it does contain the first two heroes uh, from the, the first two... The, fir the first heroes from the first book, um, Rand and Kai, they make an appearance because a good portion of this book takes place on their ranch outside of Chico. Okay. And, of, of, yeah, like I said, you don't have to have read the first book in order to enjoy this second book, but I highly recommend it. I loved, 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 loved Cowboys Don't Come Out, and I equally loved, loved, loved this book <laughs> as well. So... Cowboys Don't Ride Unicorns. The title is actually a reference to our hero's sexual preference. Uh, our hero is a guy named Danny Boone. He works on Rand and Kai's ranch, and he is also a champion bull rider. Now, his proclivities in the bedroom uh, sort of veer towards very pretty, effeminate men who like to top. Okay. That's that's the unicorn. He's searching for the elusive unicorn, and he's essentially given up. There's because they just don't exist. That is until uh, <laughs> a beautiful man named Lori uh, appears uh, on the ranch, and he's going to spend a week with his boyfriend, uh, duding it up, taking you know, <laughs> kind of experiencing the dude ranch uh, experience, experiencing the experience. Mm. Ooh. <laughs> I'm a wizard with words today. Anyway, so yes, the attraction between Danny and Lori is, of course, immediate. Uh, sparks begin to fly, and Danny is, uh, of course, first drawn to how really beautiful uh, Lori is, but as they spend more and more time together on the ranch, he begins to realize that Lori is actually more than a pretty face. He's actually incredibly smart and funny and very capable. He can he can take care of what needs to be done. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. It's very, very true. Um, so they begin to fall for one another. Lori's uh, boyfriend, uh, kind of a controlling jerk, has to go back to San Francisco on business. So Lori and Danny have some quality time together. Uh, and they get to know one another, and uh, eventually Lori has to go back to San Francisco because that's where his life and business is. And the remainder of the story is kind of about how they both need to figure out their own issues. What was really nice about this particular book is that Danny and Lori have fully formed lives and problems that they have to deal with. It's not just a, a fluffy romance where at the end they have their black moment and a big misunderstanding, and then they mm -hmm. kiss in the end and make up. They've actually got uh, serious issues they, they need to deal with. Lori uh, needs to get out from under the thumb of basically everyone in his life. They are always trying to control him. And the one way that he can um, do that is by opening his own design firm. Uh, he needs the money to do so, uh, and Danny helps out with his small little nest egg. Uh, then, unfortunately, uh, at the exact same time, uh, one of Danny's dreams comes true. An opportunity comes up, and he is given the chance to buy some adjoining land next to Rand and Kai's ranch, and he's always wanted to have his own land and uh, be able to do that. Uh, but since he's given most of his money away to Lori, he needs to go back out on the bull riding circuit and raise some money really fast. Uh, this, of course, terrifies Lori uh, because riding a bull is dangerous business. Um, 
Now, uh, they do, of course, this is a romance, they, of <laughs> course, uh, eventually figure out how to solve both of their issues, uh, and they learn how to do it together. Um, I really love Danny and Lori an awful, awful lot. Uh, and like I said, I cannot recommend this book enough. It's called Cowboys Don't Ride Unicorns by Tara Lane. Cool. Next up, I would like to uh, review the first of two holiday novellas. Uh, this one is called Vampire Claws by Robert Winter. And guess what? This is a holiday paranormal. How could we... <laughs> I think the title would have clued you into that. Okay, so Vampire, Vampire Claws is about Taviano. He is a 200-year-old vampire. And he's hanging out on the rooftops, as, you know, vampires are sometimes want to do. Um, Taviano has been sort of wandering for almost the entirety of his 200 years uh, as a vampire. And uh, one night, he's hanging out, and he notices Paul, a nice guy, who is trying to get back home with a bunch of holiday packages. Uh, when Taviano notices there are some bad guys lurking, uh, and they are planning to attack Paul. Uh, Taviano comes to Paul's rescue and saves the day. Uh, and then they, uh, as they are walking back to Paul's apartment, they get to know one another. Uh, Taviano uh, uh, eventually comes out with the fact uh, that he is an immortal and has been wandering the earth for 200 years. And Paul is like, uh, sure, that sounds great. Uh, because Taviano is really hot and they're immediately, you know, drawn to one another. Uh, they make out in his apartment uh, and get to know each other really quickly. Uh, when Paul suddenly remembers, oh yeah, I was going to go deliver these packages to the local, local uh, LGBT homeless shelter. So uh, they stop the making out uh, and they run to the shelter. Uh, unfortunately, it's closed for the night. Everyone has gone to bed. Uh, so Taviano uses his vampire powers to uh, get on the roof uh, and deliver the gifts, just like vampire claws. Uh, Paul is, of course, endeared by this. Uh, I thinks it's really amazing. Uh, and they go back to Paul's apartment and they have some really hot paranormal vampire lovin'. <laughs> <laughs> but the afterglow is uh, interrupted. Uh, uh, evil vampire uh, uh, comes on the scene. It seems that Taviano has encroached on her territory. Uh, she kidnaps Paul, and there is a big, you know, knockdown, drag out fight uh, with this. Uh, evil evil vampire queen and her minions. Uh oh. So, yeah. Uh, of course, Taviano saves the day with Paul's help, uh, and they live happily ever after. Um, I really, really enjoyed this story an awful lot. Um, you don't really... Um, when it comes to holiday uh, novellas, uh, they're almost, almost always... Uh, I'm making a very broad generalization here. They're almost always contemporaries uh, dealing with contemporary issues. So the sort of vampire paranormal twist was really nice and enjoyable. Um, I enjoyed the fact that the story took place over one night. Um, mm. uh, and was action-packed um, and uh, very, very romantic. Um, one quick thing I want to mention. Um, while... Uh, I have noticed this past week, uh, this is uh, actually a new release, by the way, um, some people who have reviewed Vampire Claws take issue with the insta-love aspects of the story. Um, and to that, I, you know, think that's a crock. Um, this is a... <laughs> I mean, look at what you're reading, people. This is, a, you know, a holiday novella with vampires. If you don't think they're going to fall instantly in love, then what What the hell are you thinking? Um, some people, um, as I said, took issue with that. I think the story actually explains the insta-love aspects of the story perfectly well. Um... Paul and Taviano actually have a connection. Uh, they're sort of there's a sort of a twist on the faded mates trope um, mm. that I think explains that away perfectly. Um, so if you're complaining about that, I don't think you read the story very closely. Um, so I highly recommend. Uh, I want to reiterate that fact. I highly recommend Vampire Claws. I thought it was a lot of fun, um, and uh, I think you should all check it out. 
Last but not least, I would like to talk about Coming Home by Garrett Groves. Uh, this is another holiday novella, and it is the first in his Home for the Holidays series. Now, Coming Home is the story of Rylan, who, in fact, is coming home for the holidays. He has actually just been laid off from his magazine job in New York City. Um, he hasn't been home in a while uh, because, in part, his because his family sucks, um, <laughs> and he doesn't want to, <laughs> understandably, doesn't want to deal with them. Uh, so this is the first time in a while that he has come home to his suburb. I think it's just outside of Detroit. I'm pretty sure it was Detroit. So he's come home, and uh, immediately he gets into his fight with his father. So he can't stay there uh, during his visit. Uh, and he runs into an old flame, uh, Ben, at the local grocery store. Ben works for the Park and Rex department, but since it is the middle of winter, he has actually picked up a couple of shifts at the local grocery store where he's a manager. Anyway, so um, Rylan runs into Ben, and he's like, oh gosh, how is this going to work out? Because uh, two years ago, Rylan, you know, took off for New York with... Uh, without a look back, essentially. Mm. Uh, so he kind of left poor Ben in the dust. Um, though Ben is like, well, okay, maybe I can forgive you. It is the holidays after all. And you don't have any place to stay. Why don't you stay with me at my house? So that's sort of the forced proximity aspect of the story, if we're going to get all tropey, and I'm going to explain those to you. Um, <laughs> now, both, both Rylan and Ben have reasons for being a little bit grinchy about the holiday season. Uh, and it's together that they kind of overcome that and sort of rekindle their affair from two years prior. Um, poor Rylan goes over to his family's house for Christmas Day. Uh, it does not go well. Um, so he kind of runs back to Ben uh, and he accepts Rylan with open arms. And it's sort of a given that they're going to try and make this work uh, for a second time. The day after Christmas, Rylan receives a job offer, a really great job offer, but only if he returns to New York immediately and is ready to start on uh, January 1st. Ben immediately jumps to the wrong conclusion, thinking that, you know, Rylan is ready to leave him in the dust once again, uh, and they have a big old fight, and so without any place really to stay, Rylan, you know, gets heads to the airport, ready to hang, hang, you know, go back to New York. Which comes to the really absurdly romantic end. Uh, ben realizes his mistake. Uh, he jumped to some pretty large conclusions, uh, and he needs to try to explain, um, explain to Rylan that he does, in fact, want to try and make it work with him. So there is a big grand gesture where he runs to the airport to declare his love. It is extra super schmushy. Uh, as it should be, since this is a holiday novella. Uh, and it made me melt. I thought it was super sweet, utterly romantic. Uh, the story then jumps forward a little bit uh, for an epilogue uh, that shows that our two heroes have, in fact, found a way to make it work and live happily ever after. So I highly recommend Coming Home by Garrett Groves if you want some super sweet holiday lovin'. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. I, I like what you said about uh, insta-love, and especially in novellas. If you're picking up a novella, mm -hmm. you've got only so much time yep. and pages to, to do what you're doing. So, of course, the love is going to happen faster than you would typically do it in a, in a, in a novel. Exactly. And, and people who gripe about insta-love in novellas, it's like, then why are you reading that if it's not what you want? <laughs> if, it's, if you don't like that... I am. Don't read those. Yeah, exactly. So you've been doing some reading as well. I have been, although not quite to the level that you've been doing. <laughs> I um, win. No, I'm yes, sorry. Yes, you do. <laughs> um, I picked up, uh, in preparation for this week's interview, yes. uh, Hell in High Water, which is Charlie Cochet's first book in the third series. Uh, I mentioned last week that I was reading this, and I think I actually said on the show, uh, how did I not come to this sooner? Mm. <laughs> Because 
I loved it. I mean, it was just like, she built this world. Now, for those who don't know, let's just back up, because... Yes. Uh, let's explain to us, what is the Thirds universe? Many of us, I think, have heard of Thirds, because mm -hmm. it is wildly popular, but what is it? <laughs> so, in this world, uh, it's a slightly, you know, it's a different take on, on the world. Something is, has happened uh, that has created this... Uh, genetic mutation of the human race. Uh, and they're called Therians. Um, they are shifters who can take uh, the form of several different kinds of animals. They're mm -hmm. all classified. They all wear little tattoos. So you you know who, what kind of Therian you're dealing with at any particular moment. And I hope I'm saying that right, Charlie. We never really talked about pronunciations. <laughs> so if I'm saying all this wrong, I apologize. Um, and because they're all so different, it has changed law enforcement mm -hmm. uh, because now you you know how are the cops going to be able to take down this gigantic lion that might, might crop up? So it's made the bad guys better, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like all of the meta humans in the Flash universe. Yes, you need something more to take care of those. Um, so the thirds is actually uh, a combination task force of humans and Therians who work together, mm -hmm. and they they pair up so that each partner unit is a Therian and a human mm -hmm. going out and doing their thing. And she, I love how she set up the agency and how there's all these different parts of the agency and how all the different teams work. Uh, I imagine she's got, and we talk about this in the interview a little bit, this, this, all these notes about what happened in the third universe and how the organization works and how the Therians work. And it, it just it, it got my kind of geek out sci-fi side a little bit. Mm -hmm. Is um, it safe to say it's sort of a paranormal procedural then? Would you classify the series that way? Or I don't know that I can classify it that way because I haven't read enough of them yet. There okay. is a case that gets worked in this book. Okay, yeah. Um, so there is probably a procedural that happens each time. Mm -hmm. uh, what I don't know is, and I didn't want to know, is like, is there a thing that arcs all ten of these books together? as like an overall thing that happens with each case that goes on individually, which might happen, okay? because I'll come back to this for sure okay. well, <laughs> over who, time. Who are the heroes in Hell and High Water? So the overall series that's been running is Dex and Sloane. Mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of the book, Dex has been uh, testifying against his former police uh, partner, his yeah. former partner, because of a killing that he did that was uh, against a Therian that uh, shouldn't have happened because it was in cold blood, essentially. Uh, he's kicked off the uh, human force because of it, essentially. He's pushed over to the thirds because he can't work in his division anymore because, you know, you turn on the cop and bad things happen. Um, that's true in this universe, too. So he goes to the to the thirds where actually his brother, who is a Therian, uh, his adoptive brother, works already. So he goes there, becomes an agent. We get all this world building about thirds. And then we're off on this case because there's been a lot of killings that go on around um, what they call the humanitarian cause. And that's people who want to bring the two races closer together. Uh, so there's a lot of political stuff going on here. Uh, it mirrors very much um, how you could view any uh, race uh, conflict that happens or even... Uh, how there are those who want to get rid of LGBT people because, you know, we're different in some ways. Um, so I like that whole underlying thing that happens. Uh, Dex is paired up with Sloane, who has recently lost his partner, um, who was also a love interest. And that's a big no-no in the third. You you can't fall in love with your partner and you can't fall in love with, you know, the person who worked right on your team because that just doesn't work well. Um so there's a lot of baggage for Sloan as he gets a new partner, and Dex is like his umpteenth new partner because he can't quite find the the replacement for Gabe. Um, so they get put together very close proximity because they've got to go work on this case. And as time goes on, Dex proves himself to be a good partner and proves himself that maybe he could also... Uh, fill the void in Sloane's life that uh, that Gabe had in that also. Which, of course, brings up all different kinds of issues because here we go again with partner dating partner, potentially, mm -hmm. and, and going forward. And I assume they solve their case. Well, of course. But they don't get the ultimate bad guy, mm -hmm. possibly. 
So there's definitely a pull forward there. And I don't know if it goes to the entire 10, but there is a move forward uh, there. And they start to have a bit of a relationship. This at least puts them in a good spot at the end. Uh, for those who know thirds, and we'll talk about this uh, with Charlie in a few minutes, book 10 is their wedding. So you know on the on the end of all this, mm -hmm. they, they, they do get there happily ever after. Cool. Uh, but yeah, I, I've babbled a little bit, and thank you for helping to guide my discussion. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm totally gaga for Hell and High Water. I see how Charlie has built this up over the last few years. Uh, to, to be the fan favorite that it is. Because mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot of fun. The romance, uh, Dex and Sloane, are perfect for each other. It's It really, Dex and Sloane, to me, are a perfect example of um, of the friction that Damon Sway talks about all the time. Oh, okay. Because, man, do they friction on each other. <laughs> 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 but then it's so good when they finally you know get together in those uh -huh. moments, too. So, yeah. Cool. Good job, Charlie, and uh, we'll be talking to Charlie in just a few minutes about thirds. Okay. Yeah. Now, this week's theme, sort of underlying theme, is what we're thankful for. Uh, this past week, we asked some of our patron supporters for what books they are most thankful for, and Emily answers that she is thankful for Scott and Scott's Romantics books. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm thankful for those as well. Uh, I remember those back in the day. They were... Uh, wonderfully written uh, and kind of unique at, for their time mm -hmm. uh, sort of take on classic romantic tropes. So uh, kudos to you, Emily. I totally agree. I'm thankful for them as well. Yeah, and she said it really um, introduced her to the genre mm -hmm. because of the also bots on those books. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Which is very cool. Exactly. Uh, Lindsay uh, points to uh, Bear, Otter, and the Kid by T.J. Klune. Uh, it was really the first book that she thought of, and as she was thinking about our question, she kept returning to that book. Uh, she mentions that it's very much a comfort read uh, for her, and it's gotten her through some difficult times. So it's great when a book can really do that for you and, mm -hmm. and always be something you return to. Yeah. Regency Fan 93 said that she's grateful for Don't Read in the Closet Volume 4. Uh, that helped introduce her to the genre. Mm -hmm. And Maureen... Uh, has two books, Carry the Ocean uh, by Heidi Cullinan. Uh, she related a lot to Jeremy, and experiencing the world from Emmett's point of view actually opened her eyes and helped her figure out how to interact and understand her nephew, who is also autistic. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome. And she also pointed to How to Be a Normal Person by T.J. Klune. T.J. is very popular <laughs> among... As always. Could, <laughs> why should we be surprised by I that? Know. Um, she knows, noted that uh, Gus is one of the most relatable characters that she's ever read. And after listening to the audiobook, uh, her inner monologue sounded a lot like Derek as Gus for about a week. Mm -hmm. And I, I absolutely know where you're coming from on that, because for me, anytime I think to myself, oh my God, it's it's Derek doing Gus right there in my head. Okay. Now, are there any books that you are specifically thankful for? I would say that I, from especially a writing point of view, I am really thankful for Bill Koenigsberg's Out of the Pocket. I've spoken to it before. Uh, it was really one of the inspirations that uh, really helped me focus to write the original Hat Trick book. Mm -hmm. um, reading how he did a sports coming out story uh, was really impactful to me, and it really got me on my way there. And it, it's still a touchstone for me. For for of all the books that I could possibly own, uh, I really you know go towards that one. Okay. What about you? I am thankful for all the books. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. That's my answer. I think we've talked about in the past some of the authors that uh, I enjoy and some of the authors that have introduced me to the genre. Uh, so I don't think I need to rehash that. But I genuinely, I'm thankful for all the books and all the authors who write the books that we are uh, all love so very much. Now, we would love to hear from the rest of you. Please leave a comment in the show notes for this episode, number 111, and let us know what books that you are thankful for. Hiking through the woods in search of the perfect Christmas tree. Sipping homemade hot cocoa in front of a crackling fire. Enjoying the company of gathered friends and loved ones. It's definitely the most wonderful time of year, and we've got the books that will keep you turning pages on those long winter nights. Announcing the Big Gay Fiction Podcast's Happy Holiday Paperback Giveaway. We're giving you a chance to win three terrific books from the Mountain Series by author P.D. Singer. 
The prize pack includes paperback copies of Snow on the Mountain, Fall Down the Mountain, and Return to the Mountain. To enter, go to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com or visit the official giveaway page at BigGayFictionPodcast.com slash holiday. If you can't get enough of stories filled with love, self-discovery, and the great outdoors, then you're not going to want to miss this. Go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com slash holiday before the rafflecopter ends on Sunday, December 9th. So finally, without further ado, mm, yes, let's talk to Charlie Cochet and hear about the end of the third series and some other things she's working on. I'm excited to welcome Charlie Cochet to the podcast. Charlie is an author by day and artist by night. Always quick to succumb to the whispers of her wayward muse, no star is out of reach when following her passion. From adventurous agents and sexy shifters to society gentlemen and hard boiled detectives, there's bound to be plenty of mischief for her heroes to find themselves in, and plenty of romance, too. When she isn't writing, she could usually be found reading, drawing, or watching movies. She runs on coffee, thrives on music, and loves to hear from readers. Her latest book, Tried and True, which is the 10th in the third series, is coming this Friday, November 24th. Welcome, Charlie. Hello. <laughs> Thank it you is, for having me. It's excellent to have you here. Um, I commented on the podcast last week that I was new to the third series and wondered why I had waited so long. <laughs> Um, and I've only got 10 books to catch up on, so... Uh, you, just, you know, just another nine in to go. Yeah. We'll, just, we'll just knock those right out. So, <laughs> for, for fans, tell us what we get in Tried and True. Well, Tried and True, like you said, it's the uh, the last book in the third's main series. Um, so, finally, we're getting to the big day, uh, Dex and Sloan's wedding day. Um, but for readers of the series... We know that nothing is ever straightforward when it comes to Dex and Destructive Delta. So they have uh, a lot to go through before they can make it to the altar. So lots of bullets flying, lots of high emotions and danger. So, yeah, it's it's going to be a fight to, to get to the IDs, but um, it's a lot of fun, too. Just another day at the office for them from what oh, yeah, I've been reading so far. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if they just, you know, went to work and nothing happened, then, you know, it, it's that would probably be scarier because, you know, something is really wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now, you mentioned this is the last book in the third series. <laughs> Looking back to book one, which came out in 2014, what was your inspiration to create thirds? Uh, well, uh, back then, um, I was a very new author. I, I mostly had historicals. Um, I wrote my first uh, shifter book, which was part of uh, the Goodreads uh, Don't Read in the Closet story prompts. Um, and it was so much fun to write. It was a husky shifter, kind of humorous um, <clears throat> story, uh, love story. Um, and I decided I wanted to write another shifter story. But I wanted to write something a bit different than what was already out there. Um, so I started looking at it from a more kind of scientific point of view. Um, and I started with, uh, what if shifters, um, were, uh, were a part of society? What if they existed and they were part of society? Um, and how would society change? Everything would change. So it all kind of snowballed from there. Um, when I started looking into, well, what was the cause of the shifters? And then after that happened, um, the new branches of government, how would law enforcement deal with these 300 pound guys that could change into tigers and kill them with the, you know, one paw swipe. Um, so it, it started from there and I wanted to write something that readers could just get lost in this world and just have, have fun, fall in love with these different characters. Uh, so that's what I was, I was aiming for. I just kind of wanted to write something that I also wanted to read. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That seems ambitious for, I mean, you described yourself as a pretty new writer back then, and even in book one, I can just see the layers of the world that you created. Were you, were you daunted by that, or just excited by the getting to build that? Uh, both. I was really excited, because I got to just, you know, there was no, because when you're really new, you kind of, not that you don't have anything to lose, but, you know, no one really knew who I was. Um, I, very few people recognize my name. So it's like, if it didn't work out, it didn't work out. I'd move on to something else. But 
there was a lot of like, God, I really hope that, you know, readers enjoy this and the series actually, actually sells because I had no idea. I had no idea. Um, but it was so much fun because it was so much bigger than anything that I'd written. And, and um, it was just so much fun to work out all the pieces and cre- come up with all the characters uh, and the world building. So it was, it was definitely a bit of both. How would you say it's evolved over the books, like did you did you set yourself up with something in book one that now like in like say book seven or eight you're like oh why did I just do that why why did I do that back there because now I can't do this up here, um, n- not really. Um, I think that the problem that I have most with series is that um, because I love creating characters so much, um, I. I, even my secondary characters, I have to give them unique personalities and build them up. So what happens is they end up evolving uh, past what I expect them to. And then um, and then it gets to the point where just like, oh, this guy's going to need his own book. So, you know, you end up with a really long series um, and you end up with like side books. Um, but it's, it's a lot of fun. But I, I, everything pretty much worked out. I didn't write myself into a corner because I, I worked all the big stuff out ahead of time. So, you know, when it comes out in the later books, it's just, it all makes sense. So, yeah, I was very careful with that. <laughs> Do you have, like, a big binder of the thirds world <laughs> sitting somewhere? <laughs> I have, for new authors, always build your story Bible early in the series. <laughs> I have files and notebooks everywhere. Um, because I didn't start my story Bible sooner because I didn't really think about it. (laughs) So starting your story Bible like halfway through, and I've actually got someone now who's, um, she's working on the story Bible for me and getting it all together and making sense of it and jotting down notes because to go back through 10 books and do that. Yeah. Don't got time for that right now, really. (laughs) But I, I do have notes of everything and, and spreadsheets and that, so I can go back and be like, you know, when you've got all these shifters, obviously you remember the main guys, but you're just like, that co-worker who showed up like four books ago, was he a cat shifter? Was he a wolf shifter? Was he a bear shifter? <laughs> so yeah, that helps. <laughs> Looking back, did did you expect it to go for 10 plus the sides, or what were your plans no. at the time? <laughs> Originally, it was a four book series. Um, but by the time I got to book two, I knew that was not going to happen. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, again, I had uh, characters who I weren't expecting to become as loved or as um, evolved as they were, one of them being Ash. Um, it, that kind of took me by surprise. And then I just really fell in love with him. Um, and he kept growing through each book, and I was like, oh, "Now this, he's gotta, he's gotta get his own, his own love story." And so, yeah, it was originally four books, but I knew pretty early on that that wasn't gonna happen. So, I was able to continue growing the world and um, the plot throughout the series. And you're you're generating them fairly quickly, at least by, by, by the standards of how I write, because <laughs> I mean, the first book, you know, arrived in 2014, and here we are at the end of 2017 with book 10. Yes, because uh, when I was doing the first book, I was actually putting together about two and a half years before it released, um, and by the time the first one released, I'd actually already um, submitted the third book, um, which was very nerve-wracking because the first one hadn't come out but I was already three deep in so you know when you're writing a series you're just like oh please yeah. um so after that because I was already starting book four um and I'd established the world they were they're easier to they're, they're easier to write once you get to a certain point because of all my characters I know Dex and Sloan inside out and now the rest of the the characters so when you're not having to develop the character, you're just growing them. It's uh, a lot less time consuming than, you know, starting from scratch. Mm-hmm. You mentioned two and a half years on the first book. For new writers out there who might get discouraged over the time it takes to do something, how would you um, split that up between 
building the world and figuring out what you were doing and then sitting down to write, what was, do you remember the ratios kind of in that? Um, I was able to take my time uh, with the world building um, while I was working on other stuff. So I was writing other books while I was working on that. Um, a good, probably 50% of my time was world building and the other 50 working on the plot. But again, at the same time, I knew because this was a series, I was working out the other books as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't just that one book. I was working on the overall plot. I was working on um, book two and three. So now um, I'll be, I've got some new series that I'm starting. So the world building will maybe take a month. Um, and then I'll, I'll start the, the first book and that'll probably take me like six to eight weeks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now that I know, now I'm familiar with world building and how it works, it's also a more streamlined process. Mm -hmm. Now, the fans of Thirds are quite awesome from what I've seen. Yes. <laughs> having having seen you at conferences periodically and the, and the fans that show up and the, the things that they've created on their own. Um, how early in the series did that kind of thing crop up? Was that as early as the, the book one release? It was as early as the first book. Um, not long after the first book came out, um, I had a reader who asked me if she could create a Facebook group uh, for the series, um, which I was thrilled about. Um, and now we're almost at 2,000, if not over, members. Um, so it's it really kind of exploded from there. And... Um, I'm still amazed by everything because, you know, I've had readers who've dressed up as the characters at conferences, who've created their own artwork, who've done crafts. Um, I have a picture of someone who baked a cake, a uh, destructive Delta cake. Um, so it's it's just, it's been amazing. It's It's been amazing. So yeah, the, the, our thirds readers are just, they're awesome folks, awesome folks. And we should note too that also, this, this this in October in, in November, Gummy Bears and Grenades came out, which is a third novella, and it arrived in audio. Now, yes. do you listen to the audios after they're done, or do you just sneak a peek to make sure it's okay and then move on? <laughs> um, I do listen to them. Uh, I was very new to to audio because once I started writing full time, I didn't have a commute anymore, um, so I didn't really have a chance into when to listen to to audiobooks. Um, so the first time was with Helen Highwater, which was very weird because not only is it an audiobook that I'm not used to, but it's also I'm um, hearing somebody narrate my own book. So it, it took a little bit of getting used to, but once I'd listened to like the second or third, then I really got into into audiobooks. Um, but I do like to listen to them because um, in case there's uh, there's anything that maybe we need to tweak for the next book, like maybe the pronunciation of a character or a voice or something. But I've been very fortunate because Mark Westfield has done an amazing job narrating this series, um, giving all the guys their, their unique voices. Um, and readers, have really they really love him. And for them, he's the voice of Dex. So um, I've been very lucky in that, in that sense, yeah. Now, I know some, some authors don't like listening to the audio because it's weird to the for them to hear the words that they wrote do you enjoy yeah. hearing your guys come to life or is it still kind of weird all this time on um i really enjoy hearing them come to life because i like i'm such a big movie geek and um when i write it's like a movie in my head so to hear them being performed to hear dex's jokes and shenanigans and all that come to life. Um, it's just really exciting. It's a lot of fun and it's exciting. So I, I do really enjoy hearing Mark perform because he performs them. He doesn't mm -hmm. just read them and he throws in all kinds of little sound effects and everything. So you're kind of listening to a mini movie, which I think is, is really awesome. And I think you add to the, to the movie feel in the books too, because while you're not using song lyrics, it's pretty clear what songs Dex has going <laughs> yeah. on in his head. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's just like, oh, if I could only have lyrics. Uh, but yeah, I try to do it so, you know, we can, because uh, like 
I'm a movie buff, but also like music is is part of my life. I'm I'm a huge music person. I I write to music. I listen to music all the time. Um, <clears throat> so it was. I mean, Dex is a child of the '80s. There was no way I couldn't, you know, have him just obsessed with that music and always have that around him. So it was so much fun creating the playlists and. Um, hinting to what he's listening to in in the books because it's it's very much a part of his life as well. Is that the soundtrack you write the thirds books too? Um, I do when it's a Dex book. Uh, there's definitely mostly '80s music being played <laughs> while I'm while I'm writing. Um, some of the action scenes um, I tend to do either film scores or um, things like Fall Out Boy, that kind of thing. But a lot of the time, it's it's classic rock or '80s music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, of course, this is the last thirds book that revolves around Sloan and Dex. But if anybody's looked at your coming soon list and your <laughs> schedule, there's a lot of thirds universe yet to come. Yes. What What do folks have a you know get to look forward to that's also in the universe? Uh, well, right now I'm writing uh, Zach and Austin's book. Um, readers have been waiting quite a while for for their book. Um, we get, uh, Lou and Bradley, Angel and Taylor, uh, Dom, who we just met in book seven, no, eight, nine, <laughs> nine, <laughs> very recently. <laughs> um, so Dom and West, uh, and of course, Wolf will be getting his own book, um, which should be interesting. How to give a killer a happily ever after. <laughs> mm. So that's going to be challenging and fun. <laughs> and will Sloan and Dex periodically just crop up to let folks know how they're doing in their in their married life? Uh, well, we'll get to see that in the spinoff series, in the Tin series. Um, that is um, them uh, in their new lives, not just professionally, but personally. So... They'll be, they'll be, you know, they're now working for Tain. It's a completely different organization um, from the thirds, and they have to balance this very, uh, <clears throat> this new job that's going to put them in situations they've never faced before. And they kind of, at the thirds, they, you know, with the job that they've had, they know there's a lot of ugly in the world, but they don't, they didn't have to come face to face with the kind of things they'll, they'll encounter as Tain operatives. Um, and then they also have to balance this new married life. They're still newlyweds. They're still getting used to being married. And then they also have their family, you know, so you have to balance being a spy with, oh, it's dad's birthday. I need to go get him a birthday present, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's it's balancing, you know, their, their normal lives with their undercover lives. Um, with the side books, we won't see, we won't really see them um, because I want the books to really concentrate on that couple. Um, and Dex has a way of kind of taking over everything. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, looking beyond thirds uh, and mm -hmm. into December, you've got the sixth book in the North Pole City Tales coming out with The King's Courage. Yes. Tell us a little bit about <laughs> what's happening in that book. Uh, well, that's uh, the North Pole City Tales series is just um, it started from um, Dream Spinners Advent Calendar, which are really sh their short uh, little holiday stories. Um, it started with Mending Noel, which um, it was just a really like sugary, sweet, adorable holiday story about Christmas elves. Um, and then I had um, <clears throat> someone uh, email me and they were like, please, 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 can you make this a series? So I didn't have any other holiday stories going on at the time. So I thought, well, this could be, this could be fun. So it's now it turned into a six book series. Um, I've kind of run out of reindeers. Um, so um, it's, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's just super sweet, sugary, hot chocolate holiday stories with, you know, Jack Frost and the King of Frost and, Christmas elves and this is this is the last book now in the in the series we wrap it up okay a little Christmas present to look forward to yes yes <laughs> but you mentioned that 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 uh, uh, thirds was really you were still an early writer of mm back then what when did you begin and what kind of led you into to this genre uh, well I've 
one of those people who didn't know the genre existed years ago when I started writing. Um, I was actually living in London at the time, and I've been writing since high school, but um, while I was in London, I decided I wanted to try and make a career out of it and get published. And I was writing a, uh, a 1930s ensemble cast, surprise, surprise, um, <laughs> romance, and um, the, one of the characters in in the book, the best friend of the main guy, um, he was gay. And so obviously there was a lot of, uh, because it was the 1930s, um, his story was a lot more heartbreaking, um, especially when his lover came into play. And I found that I just related more to his character and his situation and what was happening. And he, he and his lover sort of started taking over the book. So I had to take a step back and be like, okay, um, what's going on here? And that's when I started to when I started writing the auspicious troubles of chance, uh, which was inspired by that um, and by those characters. So that was my first one, and that's when I started researching and I started reading uh, gay romance. And um, I just I fell in love with the stories, the characters. I wanted them to get there happily ever after, um, and it just snowballed from there. And uh, you run across many subgenres as well these days between the shifters and the historicals and the detectives and all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a genre out there that you still want to tackle sometime? Um, I, I've kind of dipped my toe a little bit into contemporary. Um, so I will be doing more of that. And I'll also be doing some romantic suspense, um, which I know is, is, not all that different kind of from the thirds except m like more traditionally romantic suspense contemporary rather than paranormal um and definitely um i have an urban fantasy series that i've kind of started as well so a little bit of everything <laughs> and when you read do you do you read across all these genres as well or is there something in particular that's kind of your jam to read um, I do read across all the genres. If I read the blurb and it catches my interest and it's like, oh, that sounds like it's really good, uh, then I read it. Um, I don't read as much horror and like zombie romance, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, but I'm definitely not opposed to, you know, uh, reading one of the one of those books if, if it seems, you know, really, really interesting. But I, I read across the board. Yeah. Given how much you actually write, how do you split the writing and the reading? Because I know you know that could be a problem spot for some authors figuring out where to eke in that reading time. Yes, because I I fell into the hole. I don't have time to read uh, a while back, and um, I really missed reading. I was just like, that's ridiculous. I can't I can't do that. So I've actually scheduled time in to read because um, I'm one of those people that if I don't. If I don't do that, I can literally be at my desk from when I get up to when it's time to go to bed. And that's not good. So mm -hmm. um, I, I schedule my reading time every day between six and eight. I read for, for two hours every day. Um, and I've been getting, I've been catching up a lot on my reading and I've been read, I don't know how many books and series in, in the last few months. So that's really working out for me. Um, so I make sure that, and it's also time to relax and just, you know, get lost in in some really good stories mm -hmm. you mentioned you're a newcomer to audio are you do you go back and forth between reading print and audio or um i don't go back and forth between print and audio but i do um like once a month i i go up to visit uh, my best friends and hang out so it's a three and a half hour drive so i listen to audiobooks on the way there on the way back um, so I still listen to, to quite a few audiobooks. I'm still, um, I tend to listen to audiobooks of stories I've already read. I don't know, it's weird. Um, I haven't yet, like, bought an audiobook from a book I haven't, I haven't read. Um, I think because it's just, even though you've read the story, it's still a different experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have audiobooks that I love so much, I, I've listened to them, like, over and over, I don't know how many times. Um. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm not surprised by by people who listen over and over because it's like it's like the movie you watch again and again. 
Yes, exactly, exactly. When you really enjoy the performance and uh, like uh, Mary Calmay's Marshall series, I love, 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 love the audiobooks to that series. And I've lost count how many times I've listened to them because he just does such an amazing job and they're such good stories. Um, so, you know, I go back and, and re-listen to them, you know, so many times. Yeah. And given your movie, your, your movie love, um, who would you cast in a thirds movie? <laughs> um, I'm, sure you've, I'm, a... I'm sure you've answered this question a zillion times, but I'm very curious. <laughs> I do. I actually have a Pinterest board uh, for the thirds and it's got all my face cast actors on there. Um, for, for Dex, uh, I have Chris Pine. Um, Cause he just has that kind of like adorable, goofy yet. Uh, he just has so many different um facets to him um and uh i i read um an article they did on him once and it's like his favorite snack is like cheese it's just like it was meant Perfect. to be it was meant to be um <laughs> so for for sloan i have uh joe joe manganello um because he's got that you know alpha sexy uh thing going on but he's also a little bit of a goofball which i absolutely love He's a little bit of a nerd. Um, I've got um, uh, oh, um, I've got Gerard, like a younger Gerard Butler for Seb. Um, I've got um, I'm trying to think of the names off the top of my head. Um, there's, there's, I've pretty much got everyone face cast. Um, on the Pinterest board. So they're, they're all on there. Um, all the different inspirational images, um, for the characters. Cause readers do like to, to see that. I mean, they don't know, we don't always, you know, agree, but that's how I, I, I see sure. the characters. Yeah. We'll link people over to the Pinterest board in case they haven't been there before. I will yeah. definitely <laughs> be going to take a look as well. Just, <laughs> just to see for my own self. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about, uh, what's on your future docket what's coming up in the in the immediate first part of 2018 that readers could look for well i'm working on a new romantic suspense series for 2018 um and my hope is to get the first and second books out um march and april i'm very excited about it because it's it's very different from what i've done so far with you know one it's a contemporary series um, but it's a uh, private security uh, firm um, and these uh, four best friends uh, who were in the military who've, um, who've put together this, um, this private security firm. So it's, there's, there's a lot to and it's going to be a lot of romance, a lot of excitement and danger. And so I'm, I'm working on that for, for early 2018 and there's going to be um, <clears throat> four books in that series and then um, two world books. Um, and I've also got another straight up contemporary romance series that I'll be working on. Plus the thirds side books. So there's quite a bit. <laughs> you are what busy author. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> but if I had to guess, you have a wonderful time doing it. <laughs> oh yes. Oh yeah. I have so much fun doing it and it is hard work. It's a lot of hard work, but you know, I, I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. Very cool. Yeah. So what's the best way for folks to keep up with you online? Um, I'm on Facebook a lot. Um, I have my author profile, but there's also the Third Nerds group, and I'll be opening um, an author uh, group uh, soon as well. Um, so that's probably where I spend most of my time. I do have, like, I do have an Instagram account. Um, I all kind of, if you want to keep up to date with things that are happening, like releases, sales, um, excerpts, that kind of thing. My blog, um, we have our thirds Thursdays, which are the flash fiction stories. Um, so those, those are kind of the places where I tend to hang out more. Very cool. We will link people up to all those places and to the books. And, uh, we wish you the very best of success with the tried and true release this week. Thank you so much. And thanks for, thanks for being with us. It's been great talking to you. It's been awesome being here. Thank you for having me. 
I'm really glad that you had a chance to sit down and talk to her. I am too. It's, it's it was really great talking to somebody who's had a long time series running. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm just I'm totally impressed that it's only been about three years of publication that, that all of these books have come out. Now, granted, she worked on the first thirds for about two years with the world building and everything, but still, three years and all these books have just been boom, 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 coming out to people. Yes, quite impressive. And speaking of all these books, uh, Dream Spinner is running a pretty epic sale right now on all of the thirds books. Uh, they're all on sale leading up to the release of this final book coming up on this Friday, November 24th. We'll have a link in the show notes to exactly the page, or you can just go to dreamtomaterpress.com and look up any of the thirds books, because they're all on sale, and they will be on sale through November 28th. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so get on it. If you haven't already started this series, now is the perfect time to give it a look. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So that'll do it, I think, for this week. Coming up in episode 112, Devin and McCormick and Riley Hart are going to join us. Um, I think we've been wanting to sit down and talk to the two of them for a very long time. Uh -huh. I mean, I know I have. I'm crazy about their books. So I'm super excited to share this interview with everybody. Yeah, and this is a really good one, too, because we did it at GRL. So we got to sit down in person mm -hmm. with them. Uh, and I think it made for a great interview. So we look forward to sharing that next week. Yes. So, guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until then, guys, keep reading. For detailed show notes and the complete episode backlist, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday on all major podcast distributors and YouTube. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.